My name is Abu Amara, and I'm an attorney by day, which means I know nothing about the economy. That's why we have a great panel here. And I'm fortunate to be the moderator of this community conversation. Um, Warren, well, why don't we just get right to you? What are we here to discuss today? Well, we're going to talk about uh, the economy and its impact on particularly the black community and black owned businesses. And we thank and we are delighted to have such an august panel. Um, we have Neil Kashkari, who is the president of Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. But I particularly am excited about Neil because he's been very uh, outspoken about the issues that have affected our economy, particularly I know during after Floyd, uh, George Floyd's murder, he was the first to just blatantly say that the economy, ex ex we were dealing with uh, systemic racism. And he wasn't shy about it, he was bold, and I think other Federal Reserve members followed suit. And I think I was just delighted about that candor. Uh, but also, I'm gonna have some questions for you later on. <laughs> uh, and then we have Gene Crane. Gene is um, uh, the president and CEO of uh, Bremer Bank, um, which is also Neon's bank. Uh, she's been a, a fabulous support of Neon, uh, as I shared with her earlier during the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, we got a PPP loan under the, round, around the first round, which was unusual. And so we just thank you for that great banking relationship that we have. And Kenneth Kelly is once again with us. Um, he's the chairman and CEO of uh, First Independence Bank, which is the only black owned bank in Minnesota. And we thank you for his leadership as he's charting new waters uh, with respect to banking in Minnesota. So we thank you for that leadership as well. And for those who don't know, Warren McLean, his reputation precedes him more than 30 years um, in this space, economic development, particularly around supporting black and brown businesses and business development. And as you can see, has a great convening power and the ability to pull people together around really important um, conversations. And so Warren has already alluded to it, but I'll get into the nitty gritty about who our panel is, many of which you already know. Um, Neil Kashkari is the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, one of the Federal Reserve's 12 regional banks, which includes Minnesota, the Dakotas, Montana, northern Wisconsin, and the upper peninsula of Michigan. He serves as member of the Federal Open Markets Committee, which sets the national monetary policy. Neil began his career as an aerospace engineer developing technology for NASA super missions. Light work, clearly. <laughs> he later held a variety of roles in public service and finance, most notably as the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury <coughs> during the 2008 financial crisis, where he oversaw the TARP program. Neil now lives with his wife and two young children in Orono, Minnesota. Gene Crane is the President and executive, Chief Executive Officer of Bremer Financial. As the CEO since November 2016, Jean has combined her extensive industry knowledge with decades of leadership and experience to advance the company's strategy and performance, championing Bremer's purpose and values, and deliver on its commitment to help communities thrive. Prior to joining Bremer in 2012, Jean enjoyed a 30-year career in commercial and retail banking, honing her collaborative leadership style, passion for relationship-based client service and ability to navigate a highly dynamic business environment, and has received a multitude of awards, including from American Banker as a woman to watch as part of their 2020 Most Powerful Women in Finance recognition, and by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal to their 2019 Most Admired CEOs. And last but not least is Kenneth Kelly, who is the chairman and CEO of First Independence Bank. And as I understand it, that is the seventh largest African-American-owned financial institution in the nation. Kenneth is responsible for leading the bank's financial operations, assets, policies, and regulations. In addition to overseeing the company's management infrastructure, he serves on the board of directors of the American Bankers Association, and again, has received many uh, numerous awards, but most important to me is also a leader in 100 Black Men of Atlanta, which I find to be um, with all the things you've got going on, so, so impressive. So I want to kind of set the stage here, kind of big picture. Um, when I read the newspaper, it's, it seems that data suggests we're going in the right direction, but then there's other data points or other analysis conversation that suggests maybe we're holding back. And so President Kashkari, can you just level set with us, where are we? Where, where is the economy? Where are we going? And as you're thinking about uh, actions as part of the FOMC, um, 
What, what are you looking at in terms of how you're making your decisions? Well, we've made a lot of progress in the last couple of years in bringing inflation back down. Obviously, the big inflation spike that we all experienced after COVID, it was a shock to us. It was a shock to communities all across the country. That's come, that's come a long way down. If you look on a six-month basis, inflation is all the way back down to our 2% target. On a 12-month basis, it's around 3%. So we've made a lot of progress. We're not there yet. That's good news that we've made progress. The other good news is the labor market has remained very strong. Nationally, the unemployment rate is still a very low rate of 3.7%. Most businesses that I speak with say that the labor market is not as tight as it was a year ago, but it's still pretty tight. There's still jobs available. They're still having to work hard to find workers. And so this is a really good economy overall. We're not ready to declare victory yet. We have to get inflation all the way back down to our target. So we still have some work to do, but we're making good progress. Speaking of data, it seems, it seems to me that it's particularly you, but also the office has been focused on shedding light to make sure people understand what's happening in the economy. And one that I find fascinating is the beige book. And so for those who aren't aware, the beige book, and he'll correct me because I'm sure I'll get something wrong here, it provides data about what is happening in the economy for black and brown enterprises, black and brown businesses, because if you can't see it, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. And I think that is an important thing that, uh, honestly, he deserves a lot of credit for. So can you shed some light for folks here? What is the Beige Book data telling us about how this economy is impacting black and brown enterprises? Well, one, just sort of slight adjustment to what you said. So each of the 12 reserve banks produces this thing called the Beige Book, where we have our economists to go out and survey businesses across our region and collect these anecdotes to try to put some context around the data that we get. But actually, it was, you know, Warren, you mentioned, after George Floyd was murdered, we did, had a lot of self-reflection on what more can we do to understand the disparities in our economy. And one thing we realized at the Minneapolis Fed is our surveys are not doing a good enough job capturing minority-owned businesses, capturing women-owned businesses, and capturing the perspective of workers. So we restructured our beige book in the Minneapolis Fed to specifically say we need to go actively and talk to workers. We need to go actively and talk to small businesses, minority-owned businesses, and women-owned businesses to make sure that their experiences are represented in the data that we're collecting. And so I'm really proud of that. You know, it, it gives us better insight into what's happening. And I'll tell you this, so much about how the economy has responded post-COVID has been a surprise to us. Our economic models that we used to forecast the economy have done a lousy job in the last few years. So the anecdotes that we get from workers and from businesses, large and small, black, brown, white, every color under the sun, all of that is helping us make sense of the confusing signals that we're seeing. And so uh, this is an important contribution, I think, that we're making. And I think that this data is get making us better at our jobs understanding the economy. So Gene and Kenneth, you're navigating this macro economy, trying to make decisions that are making sure you're continuing to grow. Um, talk a little bit about the strategies you've deployed since COVID to, one, navigate those, continue to grow, but also fulfill kind of an underlying purpose to be members of the community. I'll start with you, Gene. Well, I think it's, it's really important as a community bank, we have recognized um, the impact, um, kind of the disparate impact that was created by the pandemic by you know, just so many different members of our community. Um, we've been very focused you know, prior to the pandemic on an action plan. How do we get more engaged uh, and make a difference? and take the right kind of action. And it, was, it, it really allowed us an opportunity or asked us to take the opportunity to become more educated, more informed, um, more engaged in understanding, listening, learning about the needs of the community. And, and that, that process really helped us grow. It helped us take some time and then develop an action plan that we could really find um, uh, an ability to to create and make a difference. And one of the, uh, one of the opportunities, and, and uh, Kenneth is here to really to, to share that, but was really to get involved in, in understanding the needs of black business owners and the need of people of color, peop you know, indigenous people, this gap that has been created. And frankly, when you look at um, banking uh, historically, banks created, um, you know, really helped enforce a lot of the, these systems, these systems that created disparities for people of color. 
And so part of it was just feeling a sense of responsibility and understanding that, and that's why we were so interested in, in, uh, in engaged in trying to understand not only what we could do, but what we could help others do and, and come together. And this was this initiative by, um, it's, this is Kenneth's terms, not my term, but the Fab Five. These five banks that came together, I will never forget it. It was one of the most you know, um, you know, poignant uh, opportunities in my career to get involved with four other banks in town and to sit down and understand how can we do our own work, but how can we advance that in meaningful ways. So a little unconventional, but I think what the pandemic really allowed us to do is, is understand that we can do things differently. We can approach uh, you know, the idea of how we make impact differently. And I think that was a lot of what we learned through, through the process. And we're still, we're still working through that to un try to understand how to, how to make, make impact. And we've done other work beyond that. But, but that's, that's, it, it's really about trying to sit down and understand the needs of the community, listen, learn, and then take action as a result. Kenneth? Thanks, Abu. I'll tell you, um, your comments causing me to reflect. And uh, as you think about our growth, which was your original question, I've got to continue to tell this story because it's, it's, it's impactful. Uh, probably one of the first times in history you'll see competitors come together that represent 80% of the deposits in one market and say, we want this flavor of a competitor in this market. Jean and her counterparts were sitting virtually, because mm -hmm. we, we didn't meet until the day of the grand opening, yeah. if I recall correctly. Yeah. Virtually, they pulled their badges off and said, we can make a difference, and they trusted us enough to hear our story and to be willing to listen, as Gene just said, in a manner that we could make and affect change. And so, that started in October of 2020, I recall my mm -hmm. first meeting. We meet every month since that point in time working on issues. So our bank being located here was one component of that. The second is within 30 days, 45 days, Summit Academy will have its first cohort of minority mortgage lenders. I wanna say that again. Let me tell you about the business plan and I'm gonna say that again. Our business plan for coming here was associated with the fact that minority home ownership is 25% in this area, and for Caucasians is 75%, one of the largest in the United States of America. Let that sink in, right here in the Twin Cities. Counterparts like Gene, Tim Welch, and others said, we can do something to make a difference here. Our bank presence here is a component of that, but now, starting the Summit Academy, they will actually be training individuals to become mortgage lenders because the Federal Reserve of Chicago, the Federal Reserve of Boston, and the FDIC all written reports that representation matters as you talk about those issues of the way structures were in place. So my point is that we can all make a difference. We may not save the world in its totality, but you know the metaphor, just throw back the one starfish that's on your hand. Just throw back that one. And my presence, the fact that I'm here today, is a function of the work that Jean and her counterparts got behind those little four by four screens or two by two, however many on Zoom, and said we can make a difference. And so I just wanna really yeah. press that point because we didn't just show up here to, to decide we're gonna cut our stake and we're gonna elbow them out. We were invited in. And that's a statement that I think all of us, whatever business you're in, you ought to think about how do you complement what you're doing if you're really about this issue of inclusion? Because the outcomes previously demonstrate that that process didn't work well for some. And it may have worked great for others. But if we're gonna change the process, you gotta change the way you think about it. So I just wanna commend you and your leadership well, and, and the other counterparts for accepting us and coming in. And I'll say one other thing and I'm gonna close. So Damon Jenkins, we were very intentional about the way we were gonna come into this market. I was not gonna move here. I have a sister who lives here and brother-in-law, but I was not gonna move here. <laughs> and the point I'm making is that we wanted to leverage our infrastructure to create leaders in this market. 
Damon Jenkins, who's lived here for 30 plus years, bank as a banker with Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank, now is a market president of First Independence Bank. Give him a hand. That's worth the palm for. And, and he's hired a staff of individuals that represents diversity because of those decisions that we made. Um, that is rising up here in Minnesota. So I'll stop there, but as you talk about growth, it doesn't have to be the old nuts and bolts of just give me one more, give me two more. Think about how can you do things differently that can create opportunities for others who otherwise would not have had them. And you may have alluded to the, my next question. As you reflect upon uh, COVID-19 and how we came out of that, um, what was your greatest lesson out of running a complex organization navigating what you've got to deliver, but at the same time trying to reimagine and do things new. What that, was the greatest? That, that, that's an easy one, it's relationships. And so um, I partner with the top six banks in the country right now, so whatever I'm about to say, just put that on a shelf for a learning lesson. Mm -hmm. What we found is when you work with large institutions, if it's hundreds of thousands of customers, you are a number. Mm. When you work with smaller community banks, you are a personality. And so what I will say from that is we received a few customers who were willing to call us who didn't bank with us because we could execute their PP check. As you said, Warren, the first round. That's right. <laughs> right. And so that was happening at a local level. We could move faster and swifter based on those relationships. But what I will tell you at a broader level is that it also forced us to continue to build those partnerships. Those partnerships I talked about with the top six banks in the country, that's a part of the lesson learned in relationship building and PPP. So what I learned from that is really look at strengthening your relationships. And for people of color, if you do not know a banker, and I don't mean the person who is taking your check and cashing it, if you do not know a banker, your to-do leaving this session will be get to know a banker and I'm not concerned about them being black or white, you need to know a banker first because there are times in our lives that you can't put a price tag on that. And, and I'm, let me just say this as an example. I had someone, to call, a minister call me. He said, I need you to talk to one of my constituents. And here's a scenario, and I'm not gonna go into details. Um, the individual called me they had a family member out of country and they needed money quickly. That relationship made that happen inside of that day. I'm just using that as one example. And so my point is, while it's easy to sign up for Loan Depot and the other technologies, be sure your technology doesn't supplant your relationships. That's the way I would sum that up. That's my lesson from COVID. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's so many lessons. I think you know, if I just talk about you know, what we were looking at in terms of the action plan we were creating to respond not only to the pandemic, but to the murder of George Floyd, the, these two huge elements that asked us to, as, an, as an organization, as a community bank, to really understand how we can engage. Um, I, I'll, I'll never forget this. I was reading an article at the time when all of this was going on, and and there was a quote by Desmond Tutu, and I, I actually wrote it down on a piece of paper, and it's been sitting on my desk ever since. And it's, and it, 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 it really, it really asked that that question. I think of a leader. Um, it was, it was, it, it, the quote was, try to get this close. If you are neutral during significant times of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And. It, w it just, it just like kind of hit me, and I'm like, we, we have to figure out what we can do, but we can't just go out there and try to do something without understanding that it is going to be right, it's going to make impact. When, with you know, Kenneth is is the one thing he didn't share is that he, the, working with First Independence to, to us was so exciting because they have a track record of success. They've done this work. They're committed to community. They had all those elements and. Um, and, and this, this gap is big enough for all of us, not only for us as I individual institutions, and there's mm -hmm. so many institutions that are working on this, it wasn't just our organization, but to, to bring in a black-owned bank to 
you know, uniquely served the needs of the community was part of that action. So it was exciting that, that we could uh, move down that path. But again, I think the other thing we've learned is just to understand that we need to be part of community in a new way. So one thing that we did as part of our action, again, was to uh, build, a, build a facility in, on Lake Street. And we didn't have presence there. We, you know, we, we wanted to be part of the community where people could see us, be a part of us, and then understand um, how we can best serve their needs by, by learning more from that customer. We always learn the most and, and offer the best relationship when we're closer to the customer and understand their needs. And the community um, needs are different depending on where you're situated. So that was one of the other aspects that we, um, we challenged ourselves to do was to show up be part of community and learn, uh, learn in new ways. You alluded to the fact of getting closest to the customer. Warren, I'd love your thoughts as someone who runs NEON, an organization focused on building up black entrepreneurship. As you are on the ground talking to black entrepreneurs, what are you hearing, um, particularly out of the COVID pandemic? We know, broadly speaking, many of the challenges that we face today have been the same challenges that have been going on for quite some time. But I, I suspect there may be some nuances to those challenges in light of COVID-19 and the fallout. Can you talk a little bit about your experience uh, talking to those folks and what are you hearing on the ground? Well, I'd like to reflect on COVID. So COVID, <coughs> uh, someone once told me that a crisis is an opportunity. And, um, and so during COVID, that changed the trajectory of NEON. So we wound up, and I remember um, Stephen Obeyuan and saying to me, Warren, we have to take this on. And that meant that we had to work seven days a week, 18 hours a day for about six or seven months with about eight staff. And that changed the total trajectory of NEON. We were calling clients. They were in tears because they're, um, they had they were food entrepreneurs that had uh, catering contracts that were canceled. And all of them were canceled in one day. Mm -hmm. So they were losing all their business immediately. They had no one to talk to, and we were calling them. They were in tears, uh, but they liked the fact that we were reaching out to them, that we were there for them, we were listening to them. And then we had, and then there were programs that came on stream that we had to disperse funds for in North Minneapolis. And we were able to do that. And so we did it electronically, um, so we didn't issue any checks. We deposited money directly in people's accounts. And so we were able to do that successfully, but that also changed our trajectory. So we went from serving uh, 714 clients in 2019 to 1,352 in 2020. We went from providing about 3,020 hours in uh, technical assistance to 6,784 hours in TA. And then lastly, we provided $46,000 in grants and loans in 2019. We provided 3.8 million in grants and loans in 2020. So it was an exceptional year. It changed our trajectory. <laughs> and, 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 and so, but what we really learned is the importance of being close to our, our clients or our customers. Uh, we have values that we espouse, and my team here, we can say them. Well, one of them is the best customer service in the world, relentless pursuit of excellence and respect for the individual. And we live those values. We, we, we repeat them every staff meeting, which we hold twice a, month, twice a week. And so one of the things that we made sure is we were extremely close to our clients. And I remember during the, the pandemic, uh, we were asked, uh, we didn't have PPP money, um, but we did have the opportunity to help people fill out their applications. And we were doing that online and so forth. And they were trusting us with you know, personal data, social security numbers and things like that. We were doing that to make sure that they were able to get access to those PPP loans. And that made a huge difference for us and our clients because they then really knew that NEON was there for them and that we could provide resources for them. And that's, like I said, changed the, tra the trajectory of our organization and also what's happening in North Minneapolis. I mean, this panel is here today partly because we were able to do that. Um, and so we're just grateful for that. Uh, one of the things that we learned during the pandemic, though, is our clients turned out to be a, a lot more nimble um, than even they probably anticipated. I mean, people shifted in ways that they probably didn't anticipate, mm -hmm. but they were excellent at doing it. Um, I remember one of our clients, Case Revolutionary Catering, all their contracts were canceled in, like I said, a day. But they went from catering food 
to producing a, a Stay Well tonic, which took off in 2020. And actually, the next year, it was the best-selling product and changed the trajectory of that organization. And so we had a lot of clients that were actually pivoting uh, in a significant way during the crisis, and they survived despite all the pressures and, and, uh, you know, and the tenant issues that occurred. President Kashkari, um, as I think about the data, it continues to move in the right direction, but there's other data that's a sticking point. Price continues to be a sticking point for some consumers. What's the right framework, the right mindset to be thinking about kind of balancing each of these competing indicators of how do we know in totality we're moving in the right direction or, or, or can the data say the same thing but mean something completely different? How do yeah. you reconcile those realities as you're thinking about your job? Well, first of all, we at the Fed have been given two primary goals from Congress who created us. One is what we call stable prices and we define that as 2% inflation and the other is maximum employment, as many Americans as possible gainfully employed and contributing to our economy. And we typically think of these two things as sides of a seesaw. As the economy heats up, the unemployment rate drops and inflation picks up, and then we raise interest rates to bring inflation down, but that usually leads to the unemployment rate ticking back up. So it's a delicate balancing act. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we've had a lot of progress in the last year or two bringing inflation down while not pushing the unemployment rate up. So that's really good news. We want to see that continue. But I'll tell you something, one area that a lot of people struggle with, including me, I do the grocery shopping for my family. So every Saturday, I take one of my kids with me, uh, sometimes both of my kids, to the grocery store, and I still have sticker shock when I go into the grocery store. My brain has not reset to the new <laughs> prices that we face. So even if the prices have not, they're not continued to climb in many cases, they've not gone back to what they were in 2019. No. So most Americans say, hey, inflation is still out of control. As a monetary policymaker, I would say, hey, if they're not climbing, that's progress. We're not promising you they're going to go back to where they were before. So that's a fundamental disconnect that people have between what we say, hey, inflation is coming down, and they're saying, hey, but these prices aren't coming down. And, and that's just one of the many tensions of what it is the people are facing. Um, both to Jane and Kenneth, um, can you talk a little bit about access to capital? I mean, you've, you've generally talked about the crunch, it's tight to get cash, but could you could expound on th the tension between trying to make sure you're getting funds out the door, but at the same time there's some risk mitigation. I, th it seems like a tight balance to strike when interest rates are where they are. Uh, Jane, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, our business model is to lend money and we fund those through the deposits that we gather. And, and I, I, I so appreciate what, what Neil is saying because it's, there is, I think there's still this level of uncertainty that we all have in terms of making those kinds of decisions. You know, any, you know if, you're, if, you're, if you're paying money for anything, you know, everything costs money, right? So, it, it, so we're all affected by the, any, any continued rising costs. So what does that mean? And so it, and until there's this sense of inflation has stabilized and businesses are confident about that, there's this level of uncertainty. I think people are feeling better this year than they were last year. Um, but that's, that's still the, you know, this, you know, the driving investment because people have to understand, you know, can I really, can I afford this new piece of equipment? Can I, you know, can I invest in my business? You know, because if, if they can't prep, or pass the, the pricing on, right. it's, it's just that whole dynamic of, of increasing input costs and, and can I cover that on the, uh, still remain competitive and cover it on the, um, you know, as, as I sell the product. For us, it's really important to try to just sit down and be that advisor to understand what a business is trying to accomplish and there will all be, always be cycles. I've been in the industry long enough and I was, I was sharing with Neil, I, I, when I started as a banker, long time ago, money, you know, this was in the early 80s, so money was really expensive. It was in the teens. And um, so it was, you had to really sit down and learn. It was maybe a great time to start in the business because you really had to learn how to work with someone to help advise what they were trying to accomplish, their goals, and, uh, and understand that you would not put them in a position of not being able to repay any kind of credit extension. Um, I think we're going to see some moderate growth with, with you know, credit opportunities. People always have that need. They have the opportunity to invest. 
But it is really, it, it goes back to what Kenneth is saying, knowing someone, having that partner, having that discussion is really important. Um, I think what's most important, and uh, Stephen Spears is here, he heads up our community banking group, and he always says this, is whatever we do, it has to be sustainable. It's one thing to put credit out the door and, and make a loan, and it's, other to make, it, and it's another thing to make sure that that business can sustain any kind of leverage they're taking on and be successful with that. So part of our process has really been like a, this information first is the approach we talk about it. Let's sit down, let's talk, let's understand. We've done some education sessions one-on-one -on -one or in a community gathering. For us, if we can make sure that we're understanding the needs and the goals and the objectives, um, we can help advise on that piece of it. So I think we're gonna see some growth. I'm hopeful that we will, but, um, but we're going to be um, very thoughtful about how it can be sustainable growth. Kenneth, I suspect you're stuck between a rock and a hard place here in the sense that many are gonna look to African-American-led banks to say, hey, I, we, need some, you know, we need help. But simultaneously, that, that access, the, the crunch, you're still feeling that yeah, aspect. Yeah, it, it's a conundrum. And so let me start off with hopefully the thinking of how we can leave here to make a difference there. One is a, a term that Warren just used a moment ago, which is, let's think about contracts first. African-American businesses need contracts. And those contracts can be turned into assets that can be bankable. And oftentimes we believe we can just show up because the bank has $30 million or 20 million, whatever the number may be regarding a program, and they find out, well, I don't qualify. And so there's this tension that you're just describing. <coughs> I will tell you, one of the beauties of us coming to this market um, is something that Damon pushed for. Uh, we actually have a relationship with a Fortune 150 company that wanted to make a difference in this space and create some guaranteed lending. Um, it's Cummings Inc. I don't mind sharing with them or with you. And in that process, we have an individual who could not qualify for SBA, would not have qualified for traditional underwriting, which banks have to adhere to. Uh, but the access to capital issue was one that, because of this program, we've been able to help make happen for him. He has a store now in the uh, Mall of Americas, just outside of Nordstrom's on the fourth floor. I visited there yesterday. And he was beaming with pride because he said this was something that the Black Bank was able to do for us. Now, I'm not holding that out as the one exception and we're going to cure the world. Let me be clear about that. We still have regulatory issues to manage through. But the point is, we talk about access to capital. What we've got to do is figure out how to create more capital that's accessible. This is one example of that. Damon led that effort because he was wanting to make a difference in this market. And let me be transparent. My traditional lenders in Detroit, Michigan, did not want to do this program. <laughs> I'll say that again. They did not want to do this program because it didn't fit the box. My point is that we have to begin to figure out how can we do some things differently, not all, some things differently to be more inclusive. There is a reason, as you mentioned a moment ago, Gene, the outcomes are the outcomes because the infrastructure that was put in place produced the outcomes that we have. And as an engineer in training, we understand one side of the equation, we also have to understand the other. They have to balance. If they don't balance, it's not an equation. I think we all know that. The point I'm making is that as we talk about access to capital, we have to think about other ways that we're creating variables on one side that can help lead to different outcomes on the other side. Doesn't mean we're gonna do it 100% of the time, but we have to be willing to take on that level of innovation, that yeah. level of, 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 you used the term a moment ago, risk. Risk. We, we, we could take on. Can I add one thing? You know, one thing we saw when COVID hit with all of our surveys of communities was, you know, before the pandemic, there was this decline in American entrepreneurship. The number of businesses that were being founded by anybody was just steadily declining. When COVID hit, we saw an explosion of entrepreneurship, especially an explosion of minority entrepreneurship. So <clears> like the, the hunger of entrepreneurship is there. And that's where you have to marry that hunger of entrepreneurship with the access to the capital so that it can be realized. And so that was actually a positive that came out of COVID mm -hmm. is we saw all this entrepreneurship come from the ground up. And I think your example is a great example of that. Exactly. 
President Kashkar, you obviously you have colleagues all across the country. Um, you're, you're thinking big picture, but you're also thinking what's happening in this region. Um, Indian country is a big part of, of this territory. Can you talk a little bit about, without getting into details, just the nuances and the, and the gradations of you know, what you're looking at here for black and brown people or in Indian country versus maybe some of the challenges other Fed presidents have around the country? Well, one of the things that's interesting about our region is our region in many ways is a miniature United States of America because every major industry in the United States virtually is represented here, whether it's manufacturing or healthcare or agriculture or mining or energy. And usually some sectors are doing better and some sectors are doing worse. And so actually when, I, when we go around, my colleagues and I, and survey our region of the country, we get a very good snapshot into what is happening across America as a whole. And then of course we have the richness of all of the diversity to understand where are the pockets of challenges where are the pockets of opportunity? I will say Indian country is markedly different than every other minority community. You know, if, if um, let's say black unemployment is 6% and white unemployment is 3%, you go to most reservations, Native American unemployment is 50%. I mean, it's a different scale. And the, the challenges that we face as we go in there, just to understand what is the data, what is happening, these are, these are vexing challenges that are confluences of economic, of education, of law enforcement, of overlapping jurisdictions. And so what we're trying to do here, you know, one of the things that we saw the, in, during the pandemic, a lot of money was being put out to communities. Some of it was being targeted to Native American communities. But we realized working with the Treasury Department in Washington and our colleagues in Washington, that they didn't even have access to the basic data to know how do you structure the programs so a native owned business could even access that program. And so this is why we, we have a whole research center trying to focus on making us smarter so that we can make the rest of the government smarter as they design these programs to make them accessible uh, for all types of businesses, including native owned businesses. I'm not sure if that's a direct answer to your question, but that's an area of big focus for us too because it's incredibly complex. You alluded a little bit to the kind of entrepreneurship decline, but then COVID, either through necessity or through opportunity, really facilitated a renaissance in entrepreneurship. Warren, can you talk a little bit about, have you seen that um, as you're doing your work in Neon, that as you know, COVID hits, people are coming out of it and saying, you know what, now's a good time to try to start a business. Now's a good time to do this. And what are some of the services or things that Warren, uh, Neon's been doing to build them up? Uh, yeah, we've seen an increase in entrepreneurship. Actually, a AEO, which is the, a micro business uh, research organization. So the black entrepreneurship is actually higher than white entrepreneurship, the rate of entrepreneurs going into business. Um, and um, and the, the, the wealth of a black entrepreneur is 12 times the wealth of his or her peers. So it's, it's, very, um, it's a, a powerful tool in, in, to in terms of closing the racial wealth gap. Uh, the other challenge though is they also have a higher failure rate. And that's where NEON comes in. So we, we help change that trajectory. I would say after four or five years, 95% of our business is still in business, which is extraordinary. Mm. Um, but it's because of the relationship that we have with our clients. So we're able to work with them extremely closely and help them really understand their business and provide the right level, right level of intervention. So there is an uptick in entrepreneurship. Um, I think there's also um, the fact that entrepreneurs are uh, aspiring and there are more examples of success um, and, and particularly in North Minneapolis I'm really encouraged about the fact that a lot of the uh, black leaders are investing in North Minneapolis they're intentionally coming into North Minneapolis buying buildings starting businesses um, which I think is exceptional um, and so that's also fueling I think the entrepreneurship uh, uh, you know train and one thing I would say that the recent uh, legislative session in 2023 was exceptional. Um, we had, um, uh, I think, led by Senator Champion and his group, we have now about $80 million that's now devoted to l underserved communities. The largest amount of that pool is going to go to North Minneapolis. So about $30 million will come into North Minneapolis. And that's exceptional. I mean, it's never happened before. Uh, and then about 26 million is going to go to South Minneapolis and another 20 million is going to go to uh, Midway and St. Paul. These are all grants, uh, which is exceptional. So I think we have an extraordinary opportunity 
uh, for these businesses, and these are particularly targeted at small businesses. So if you have sales above 750,000, you don't have access to this. So, but if you are less than that, you have access to these funds, and these grants are about uh, as large as $50,000. So this is an environment that I think is exceptional and that we need as a community to take advantage of it. Gene and Kenneth, backstage, you, we talked a little bit about kind of the, the paper white smoke. When do we know confidence is going to move up a little bit? And so as you're thinking about getting money out the door, but at the same time making sure it comes in and you're growing, how are you, what indicators are you looking to to say, you know what, okay, that gut feeling can kind of start to move a little bit more? Because you're balancing these two, you know, seemingly incompatible feelings, but what are you looking for, those indicators? You know, as the Fed does what it does, as we see macroeconomic numbers come in on labor side, on, on the money side, wh what, are, what are you looking for? Well, at this point, I'm looking for stability in terms of what we're seeing across the marketplace. I think the Fed has done a good job in really bringing down the inflation. Uh, but coming out of COVID, we, st we don't have as much of a demand problem as we have a supply problem. Um, and so when you look at housing now, I mean, you see affordable housing, desirable housing, you basically pay full price for it in desirable neighborhoods at this point in time. And that's a sign that, you know, we don't have enough supply. And hopefully that will come down. But what has happened is the risk taking on housing has changed from the 2007, 2008 timeframe. You don't see builders out there building spec homes for the sake of someone's going to come buy this home because I know the financial metrics are so loose that someone will get in this house. All of that has changed, but my point is we're seeing it across um, machinery. We're seeing it really across the world in terms of where you may be ordering product from. And so I'm hearing that from some of our customers across the board. We are still dealing with a supply side uh, issue that probably typically wouldn't be thought of as a seesaw of supply and demand. So what we're looking for and what we're advocating, let me say it this way more um, clearly, we know there's gonna be a presidential election later this year. Um, those are always times that create some form of, let's call it discomfort, I won't say instability, discomfort for some versus comfort for others. <coughs> it is my belief that regardless, and, and my, what I'm espousing to this audience, regardless, your priorities should still fit regardless of who's in office. And so as Warren just talked about a successful legislative session, it shouldn't matter if it's a Republican in office or Democrat now. We all have our choices, let me be clear about that. But your agenda and your prioritization for your neighborhood and the people you care about should supersede the politics of the office. And so what I'm looking for is seeing that consistency of messaging, the consistency around the concern for North Minneapolis, the consistency around the concern for African-American entrepreneurs. And as President Kashkari said, more specifically, the fastest growing group is African-American female businesses, mm -hmm. fastest rate. We've got to figure out how to support them in their business ventures, mm -hmm. contracts, you name it. There should be an agenda associated with that regardless of who becomes president in December or January or whenever it's decided. That was a joke. <laughs> 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 but the point, the point I'm making is that you know, as a banker, what we're looking for is that consistency from the community um, because we believe all politics is local. And regardless of what happens in D.C., while it does affect us in some ways, at the end of the day, you're still going to have to put bread on the table. You're going to have to pay tuition. You're going to have to buy that bacon and sausage that's $7 or $8 a packet now. And so my advocacy is for us to have a, an agenda that really supersedes who's in, admin, in the administration in such a manner that you can be sure that those resources are coming back. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, I mean, consistency, it's so well said, Kenneth. I think, you know, it's, there's always going to be cycles in the economy. I think mm -hmm. it's really important for the community to know, for business owners to know that we're, we're interested, that our doors are open for business, mm -hmm. that we will, you know, people are, go through different stages of, the, of their business and not only, do, you know, they don't always need capital to grow and get started. They need all these other services as well. And so I think we're going to see opportunity to talk about, you know, risk management and fraud and, how to help uh, you know cash you know manage someone's cash in the business how to do payments better there's so many dynamic parts of a, running a business 
And so it's that comprehensive, that holistic approach to helping someone out. You know, you're right, there's, there's um, this great formation of a lot of new businesses. The, the challenging thing when you talk about capital is, you know, 90 plus percent of these businesses are service businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's the challenge, but I, will, I love what, what uh, Warren is saying. There's, there's ways to connect people with resources, with partnerships, and that means that we, we our teams, need to be better educated about how to make, make those connections, how to make sure that people have access. Because there is this amazing opportunity, I think, in the state of Minnesota right now to, to offer those, those kind of, that kind of connectivity. One thing that we really learned during the pandemic as we were doing the PPP loans is you would sit down with individuals and they were just so unprepared to, to um, have the information yeah. to get yes. what they deserved. But they hadn't, you know, they didn't have the advisor and the accountants. They just don't have that same network and that connections. That's something that we learned, and we're trying to make sure that we have, uh, you know, again, that listening, learning, educating um, piece of our business to understand the needs of the community better. But uh, we're open for business. We're interested. Uh, we 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 we're going to have conversations. It doesn't mean we can do everything, but there is. Uh, I think there's a ton of value in helping you know, get someone ready to be that, uh, that, that customer of a bank, especially from a lending standpoint. But in the meantime, there's so many other services and, and opportunities for a business to be successful by, by having that partnership with their banker. President Kashkari, obviously we're looking at the macro here, having conversations about the economy overall, but we've got lots of entrepreneurs, soon to be entrepreneurs, folks watching and here. Uh, could you give us a sense of kind of industry specific challenges, one or two that you think are really um, factors folks should think about as we're thinking about kind of the economic comeback? You know, is there a sticking point in industry A or B that, you know, entrepreneurs and others should be aware of? Well, one thing that, you know, Ken has talked about everywhere we, when I travel around our region, almost everywhere I go, there's uh, a frustration about the cost of housing, the unaffordability of housing. Uh, and it, as we've analyzed it, the Minneapolis Fed pretty intensively, this is 90% about supply. Mm -hmm. And there are so many barriers that are erected by local communities to stop more supply coming in, literally because people like their neighborhoods the way they are. And if you build an apartment building on my street, I fear that you're gonna change how my neighborhood feels like. Mm -hmm. And when every little city does this, all it does is drive up the cost of housing by making it unaffordable for anybody. What, what, no matter what kind of job you have, it makes it unaffordable. And so that's an area where I think we all have to contribute to opening our eyes to what is really causing all of this barriers. You know, because there are developers who want to come in. There are banks who want to lend them money. But if there are all these local restrictions preventing them from coming in, then they simply can't come in and then it becomes unaffordable. So housing is an area that is structurally challenged, but it, the good news is it's a self-made problem. And so that means it's within our capacity to try to address it. So that's one, that's one separate sector that I would just call out. Uh, more broadly, one area where there's just massive investment going in is everything IT related, whether it's AI mm -hmm. or it's the green energy transition into wind and solar or it's data centers. There continues to be extraordinary amounts of money going into these sectors extraordinary amount of need for talent, whether it's computer programmers or it's electricians or the other technicians to help build the data centers or to staff the data centers. That's just a huge growth area for the, for the country, it seems like as far as the eye can see. So that's another area for entrepreneurship, for folks who are considering what they wanna study when they go on to either back to college or go to school for some additional training, that continues to be a huge growth area. So I would say those are two structural areas where there needs to, there's going to be a lot more growth, but there are also challenges. So now that, that those growth areas have been identified, Warren, can you talk a little bit about when an entrepreneur comes in your door? Um, you know, where is their kind of general focus? What, what sector, what area? Um, and how do we kind of mesh this opportunity with the uh, black entrepreneurs who are coming into your door each and every day? Well, um, you know, 40% of our clients are in food, so that's the first thing to think about. So, um, <laughs> But you know, the last community conversation we had was on technology, and we ran two of them. And we had some of the most uh, extraordinary uh, entrepreneurs in the technology area. We had one that's, that's in aerospace. He has a project that's on Mars right now. now. And then we had another one 
that doesn't even take on challenges unless nobody else can do it. <laughs> and so we are trying to encourage uh, STEM, and we, had, we actually focused the last one on high school students so that they would get into STEM and take advantage of AI, as, as, uh, as Neil talked about. So, I mean, what we're trying to do is kind of shape where folks go, um, and some of it is just natural, like in food, but we're also trying to provide an opportunity and exposure to other areas like we did with the, with the STEM. And then, in fact, the next session will be on, um, on acquiring businesses. So um, stay tuned for that one. Uh, this question to the three of you. Can you shed some light on how the Minnesota economy is doing versus kind of the rest of the country? We've kind of sliced and diced based on you know, racial demographic or region, but I think it, you know, if you're an entrepreneur in Minnesota, you want to know how are we doing relative to others. Could you shed some light on your experience with that problem versus kind of the broader macroeconomic problem? Start with the president. Yeah. Sure. I think the Minnesota economy is doing well. I mean, I think the unemployment rate is low. Uh, most businesses that I talk to uh, say they're still working hard to find workers. There's still good job opportunities available. Wages are still growing. Uh, they're not growing as fast as they were a year or two ago, but they're still growing at a healthy clip. People are catching up to some of that high inflation. And most sectors of the economy, I think, are doing well. And so there are always going to be pockets. We're also very healthcare exposed. We have a lot of healthcare service providers. We have a lot of med tech companies, as you are aware of. And healthcare is a structural, structurally growing part of our economy simply because we're an aging society. So I think Minnesota has a lot going for it. Um, but, you know, we need to continue to try to get things right. Yeah, I, I mean, Neil knows that question, the answer to that question best, but I think just from an, from an anecdotal, you know, looking at our institution, we're seeing very healthy pipelines of business. Yeah, so we, we, aren't, um, we aren't seeing, I think there will be some, uh, you, know, so, you know, some welcome to an understanding if, if the, when the Fed, if the Fed starts reducing rates, that's gonna just answer the question that we've hit that, that plateau. And I think so there's a little bit of wonderment there in terms of um, are, are we there yet before some of the investments, some, some, you know, some of the, uh, the opportunities that people are pursuing. I think there's a little bit of hesitation still just yet, but we are seeing a really, um, you know, I would say pretty healthy uh, book of business that is forthcoming. Our, our challenge is always to understand how do we, you know, with the, with the nature of, of just the way our business works is to, to be able to fund that, uh, the, the, that asset growth, those loan opportunities. And for us, that's still something in, uncertain in our business is because there has been, you know, there has been a lot of movement of cash to, to seek yield, and that's fair, we understand that. But um, how, do, how do we make sure that we are, again, pricing the, the asset side along with what we expect on that, the cost of funding? So there's a little bit of that dynamic going on today as well uh, for, from just a, you know, I think all, all, all banks are kind of wrestling with that issue a little bit. What's the cost of the funding? But from a standpoint of the, the um, business opportunities we're seeing, I would agree. I think it's, it's healthy. We're seeing a lot of interesting kind of new opportunities surface that have been, you know, maybe a little more subdued the last couple of years. Yeah, my view is uh, slightly different because I'm going to angle down a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, Neil's best to hit the big macro, and Gene probably sees more of the intermediate economies, the way I would sum it up. We see a little bit of the what's happening in the hood is what I would describe. And, and sometimes that beta is different. It, it's, it does this when the line does this, that line does this. Uh, the good news is that I think um, to Warren's point, we see a lot of upward opportunity. The funding, the down payment assistance, the first generation housings, we are part of all of those solutions. But I would tell you at the end of the day, you have to ask, is the average home ownership increasing? Is the average wage for people who are of color, um, is it going up at the same rate or at a rate faster than the average? My view would be the answer to that is probably not. And so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I can quote you the stats on is X number of businesses here and it would take Y number of businesses to, equ to be equivalent with Caucasians for black Americans, but that's an academic exercise. We know if you had to go through that, I wouldn't be here to see it happen anyway. The question is, what can we do to change the lives of 
one African American family to move them up the equi economic mobility spectrum. And I think we have to continue to ask that question in the way Jean talked about it, which is, are we willing to listen? And are we willing to do things a little bit differently? Are we willing to demonstrate that we can be innovative in how we approach these problems? Because if 40 years from now we haven't done anything differently, the outcome, someone's still going to be talking about the housing gap in Minnesota is one of the largest in the country. And so if we're not trying to solve that problem, then shame on us. But I will ask you, when we think about the economy, are we changing that at a fundamental level such that you know, your son or your daughter can now have the same education as the kid that lives in the neighborhood that has an average household income of $300,000. That's a problem that we have that we see in our community. And so when you go to take the test score to see if you can get into Harvard or any of the others, those challenges economically have impacted us negatively. And so that's the angle I want to bring to this conversation because it impacts the job that I receive when I do finally get through Harvard uh, as much as it does for the kid who goes to U of M here. And, and, and so the opportunities are just different. So I think we've got to continue to drive at the, not the broader economy but the least of these and being sure that resources are being applied in an equitable manner across the board. And we've got time for one last question. We've got a lot of folks who want to start businesses, who want to prepare themselves, who want to be equipped, um, who, who have family members who want to do that. On, on the financial institution side, my question is, what's the one or two things, other than just come correct, right? Make sure your balance sheet is good, all of that type of stuff. What's the one thing, piece of advice you would give? Because you see folks come through your door all the time seeking to get access to capital. And it, it may not work out for this reason or for that. So is there some qualitative advice you may give? I wouldn't say qualitative, but I would say don't let your pride get in the way of mm. you receiving your blessing. What I mean when I talked about a moment ago, getting to know a banker, learn the rules of the game. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but every bank does underwriting in a certain way. And if you're not understanding what they're asking of or requiring of you, then sure it's going to feel like they're being discriminatory. But the point I'm making is that build that relationship in such a manner that someone is willing to tell you, you got to fix this problem. It's the reason we're now doing credit counseling. We're also into, got a program with, with Cummings where individuals are going through and learning how to manage their money in a way that they are getting rewarded for going through those programs. So we're trying to change the way we think about these problems as opposed to just saying this has to be solved. And so if I had to say that, you know, all of us probably, you know, going back to, I can't remember who's, maybe you said it, Gene, I think about companies not being as well prepared. We saw minority businesses when it was time to apply for PPP, they needed a different kind of help than the company that makes five million who calls the accountant and he pressed the button and the whole packet is over there. That's a completely different ball game. When you are a cobbler, I'm gonna use that, that term, you're good at doing the shoes, but all your receipts are in the shoe box, mm -hmm. right. right? Right, right. You understand why? Yep. I've had that problem too, <laughs> let me just say it. But the point I'm trying to make is that don't let your pride of where you are stop you from where you need to go. It's the way that I would sum it up. I appreciate that. I think that's really well said. I think just know that um, bankers are interested. That's our role, that's our job. I, I've actually worked with someone who had a shoe box. And, and, <laughs> and I love that because, um, you know, it. All these businesses, this, the, the richness of the different types of businesses and size of businesses is really what creates a healthy community. Mm -hmm. and, and banks understand that. Community banks really want to be a part of driving that, those opportunities for individuals. You know, there isn't this set form you come in and fill out for a, for a business loan, right? It's not a personal loan. There's a little bit more formal application or, you know, maybe a template for that. For a business, it's really, some of it just starts with telling the story. What am, I, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to accomplish? I mean, there, is, there are these requirements. As, as a bank, we are highly regulated, and that's, that's, that's appropriate for the business that we're in and the, how we fund ourselves. But when you think about you know, the collateral position and the capital, the capacity to repay, you know, um, just you know, the economic conditions. I grew up as a banker, so I still, I, I still remember all this as a lender. But um, 
but the most important thing is really the character of the individual, right? I still put so much weight into the fact of who are you, what are you trying to do? Because we, we can connect you with resources, we can connect you with um, advice or, or creative advice and, uh, and opportunities by working with partners within the community. Um, but just, just know that banks are interested in having that conversation, putting you on a path for success. And, and I think there's, um, there's every opportunity, no matter what stage you are in with your business, to build that relationship with the banker. Mm -hmm. That will really be the, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to have someone find their way through that process. And, 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 and don't think you have to come in with all the answers and, and all well prepared. Uh, the conversation is, is really where we can, we can find our way to, uh, to success for anybody who's interested in building that. And President Kashkari, obviously, you're rooted in the numbers and the data, um, but what would you say to entrepreneurs, maybe on kind of the consumer confidence side, just on the side of how do you feel about the fundamentals of the economy as we progress in 2023? You know, it's funny, uh, you, you phrase it that way. This is one of the disconnects. When people are being surveyed, generally speaking, people are still feeling quite anxious about the economy, businesses as well as consumers. But then if you look at how people are spending, people are spending. <laughs> and so there is a disconnect between what they're saying and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm looking for signs that those two things come into alignment where they start answering the way they're actually behaving. Because one of our big surprises is people are spending. They're going out to eat. They're getting on airplanes. They're taking trips. And it's like, well, where's all the pessimism based on, on their behavior? So um, I don't know. Like, I don't know <laughs> when we're all going to get over this COVID shock, the inflation shock, and we're going to feel at peace again. I don't know when that is. I hope it's soon because it'll be a lot easier to figure out which direction the economy is going. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panel. Uh,